Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Today's project, today's chore, today's task is to make a bunch of little miniature cannonballs for this cannon that I'm building. They're going to be half inch in diameter, which is approximately, oh, look at that, how many centimeters versus how many inches? Half inch in diameter, that's a 50 caliber. So that's what, 12.7 millimeters ish. And I, I really hate to touch this metric ruler because I always break out in the rash when I touch something metric. So we'll just stick with the Imperial for now. Anyway, I know I'm going to get 15,000 different comments from 100 different countries on, hey, you could have done it this way. Yep, I know. There's about a billion different ways that you can turn a ball. You can turn part of it. You can turn the front. You can turn it on a stem. You can do it in a bridge port, in a mill vise with a boring head. And I tell you, if you haven't checked out Stefan Goddess Vinter, You've got to go over his channel. I think I will I will attempt to remember to put a link to his channel in this video, and you've got to see how he did that. I was really impressed with how he did it. So go check him out. Great channel. And he sounds like the Terminator, which makes him easy to listen to. Stefan, greetings. I'm going to make my balls out of brass. It's just a good thing to have an extra pair of brass balls laying around, so I'm going to make sure that I do that. I'm going to make a few extras. They're going to be fun to make. And they're going to be a two-step process. So let's get over to the mill and make it happen. Take two. Let's go over to the lathe and make it happen. There you go. That's better. Starting off with a half-inch square high-speed steel tool bit, very aggressively ground on this side. I'm going to do this with a form tool. I'm going to put in a quarter inch radius in the top of this and finish it on the mill with an end mill a carbide end mill to give it a nice square or a nice true diameter and we're going to get over to the lathe and use it let's do it In order to make it easier to position the radius gauge on the top of the tool bit, I always put the tool bit in a grinding vise, position flush with a one, two, three block and give it a little squeeze. That just gives me a whole lot more room to position the radius gauge taken from this set right here. This is a Starrett radius gauge set. I've had this for a lot of years. You can probably find these in a swap meet or on eBay. And I'm glad I got that in my toolbox. That just gives me a lot larger surface to lay the radius gauge on and use the scriber. And I'm sorry about the, you actually can't see the scribe making the line. You'll see it come in here in a second. But I was paying attention to the operation and not the camera. Anybody that has watched any of my videos knows that my Beldor grinder, I have a coarse wheel on the left, a fine wheel on the right, and the tables are set at different angles specifically for a rough and finish grind on the tools. With the majority of the tool bit being ground away at a very aggressive angle, I'm going to put this in the mill now at a very slight angle and use the corner or the edge, the side, of an end mill to finish this profile off. You can do it in a grinder if you have a wheel dresser or whatever. Now keep in mind that the steeper the angle on the tool, the less accurate the feature is on the top. Now what does that mean? Well, let's see. I will illustrate that for you. Okay, let's use this profile right here as an example of what I'm talking about when you grind a tool. You're looking at this straight on. This would be a zero rake tool. As that tool starts to get more of a rake, you can see the radius starting to flatten out. Okay? Now that makes perfect sense, and that is something that you really need to take into consideration when making a form tool. Be careful not to put in too much rake, because the profile that you want to cut, the profile that will ultimately be on the tool, is going to do the same thing. The profile is going to lay down, the arc is going to flatten out, and it will no longer be what you think it's going to be. So stay mild. Stay just mild enough to cut, and we'll see what happens. 
Now this particular clip illustrates perfectly the benefit behind the aggressive initial grind angle on the face of this tool. If you were to use this tool on a piece of steel as ground, it would wear away pretty quick because of the sharp angle. But the sharp angle comes into play when you put the finished profile on the face of the tool. The finished profile is a much milder angle and will only consume a very small part of the face of the tool. You can see the shiny part when the end mill is removed and that relieves the pressure off the tool and saves you a little time as well. Be sure to use a stone and remove any burrs that may have been thrown by the previous operation. Let's take a quick look at the tool that will be used in the next demonstration. This is the tool that you just watched me make. And if I had any suggestions whatsoever about how to improve this tool, these tips right here should be stoned to a, just a mild flare so it runs out. This is a real dig point for a plunge operation and could potentially lead to circular track marks being left in the final product with little or no penetration into the part. So keep that in mind. That's the tool we're going to be using. And for whatever reason, make sure that if your feature on your tool is centered in your blank, that the edge of your blank, this edge, is beyond the face of the material. That way when the radius runs out, you're going to have sufficient material on the blank. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's get over to the lathe, set it up, make it happen. Anytime you have an operation where there's going to be a lot of surface contact between the tool and the part, make sure that the material is as close to the gripping a device as is physically possible and safely possible. That will reduce the potential for chatter and give you a much better finish and a lot less headaches. Right here I'm just parting it off. Actually I'm establishing the length and I'm going to remove the waste material on either end before the part drops off. I got to do this 10 more times so we're just going to kind of walk through it. Now the next one hangs out a little bit farther and there's going to be some noise. Watch the surface. You can see it sticking out farther than it normally should be. Watch the surface finish. It, there you go. There's the noise. Slow the RPM down. Get to your number. Make sure it goes around at least one time and get out. That will serve you well. No dwell, no yell. Okay, now that I have a table full of little slugs that look exactly like this, the next concept in line is to hold this at 90 degrees and repeat the cut. Since the ends will now be spinning this way with the axis of the machine running across the ball, the exact same form tool should do the job. At least that's the plan. So here's the form tool itself. By rotating the part 90 degrees and holding a pressure turned, you should be able to complete the ball. Now, in doing so, there will be a depth setting, there will be a left-right setting, and if you're lucky, everything ends well. So, let's take a look at how we're going to hold that. I am going to pressure turn it in a nest that looks just like this. This is the same material the balls were cut from, but I put a sleeve on it, or excuse me, I put a shoulder on it so that I can push it hard into the collet and it's not going to slip under the grip pressure. little cup for the tailstock and when everything is set up this is what we're going to be looking at it'll spin down and we'll turn the ends off of it shouldn't be a big deal let's make it happen When you reposition the part, the two extended journals on either end of that semi-ball do not have to spin perfectly just within the boundaries of the form tool coming in. And you'll be able to see by eye the finish on the tool goes from like a strobe to a very smooth surface. 
There may still be some witness marks on this particular part, but don't be afraid to grab a file and have at it. I'll guarantee this part's going to come out within two thousandths spherical. And for a cosmetic cannonball, I would say that's more than sufficient. I want these parts to look cast and not machined, so I'm going to stick them in the blaster. This is a uh, glass bead, number six glass at about 80 pounds, and this will put a nice satin sheen on them, make them look cast, and remove a lot of the machining lines. My intent was to have a very small pyramid containing 10 cannonballs, and I'm going to need a base to keep it from collapsing under the weight of the extra balls. That's what I'm making here. When this model's done, this will be part of the base. Not plastic, it'll be wood. 